I, I want to start by thanking uh, Dean Lopez and uh, Rick Stein for that very generous, warm introduction. I'm so delighted to join you all today. Um, I'm grateful to Rick, CEO of uh, Arts Orange County, and Scott Fitzpatrick of the Orange County Department of Education for inviting me to share some thoughts with you. Um, and to everyone in attendance, thank you for all you do to advance the arts, culture, creativity, and arts education in your communities. Your work is so critical to strengthening our sector and to working towards all of us fulfilling our potential as individuals and as a nation. It is an absolute honor and privilege to have been appointed by President Biden to serve as chair of the National Endowment for the Arts. I've been in my position for roughly a year now, and I've been traveling around the country to talk with people working in the arts and culture sector. And through their experiences, I'm trying to get a, a really informed sense of what's happening on the ground, what's happening in a time of hardship for many, but also in a time of great possibility, especially if we recognize that we're in a position to imagine and create the next version of our sector. Before I get into what's happening at the NEA under my leadership, I want to share just a few personal notes, some core ideas that I have informed my career and are informing my work in Washington. Um, my commitment to the arts began early, and it began at home. My parents weren't artists, and they weren't wealthy arts patrons, but they believed that my brother and I should have artful lives. They believed in cultivating our curiosity and creativity. They also saw the arts as a way for us to better understand where they came from. They wanted us to understand that our history is rich and complex, they wanted us to know that people from our cultures were brilliant and capable of genius. They wanted us to be proud of our backgrounds and have curiosity about others, the ability to recognize meaningful differences as well as our common humanity. And this carried over into my career. I've worked at the intersection of arts in many fields and in the arts for 25 years more, actually. Uh, and I approach it from a base of urban planning and comprehensive community development, focused on justice, equality, and especially for historically marginalized communities. And what I'm certain of um, is that none of the things that we say that we aspire to as a nation of opportunity are possible or durable without understanding the role of the arts and related work. You all know this, but I'll say it anyway. The arts help us make sense of the world. They offer us different ways of thinking, feeling, and being. They are a source of inspiration and innovation. They're critically important to our resilience and our ability to thrive. And the arts help us protect and advance our humanity, see our interconnectedness, and help us recognize our commonalities. I use this wide lens when I refer to the concept of art, and the following ideas have been guiding my work over the course of my career. They sort of shape my lens, and I'll, sh I'll share them with you. The first is that the ability for all people to make sense of the world and be creatively expressive on their own terms, that is a key element of a just, equitable, and healthy society a just, equitable, and healthy community. And this idea of being, made, being able to make sense of the world on our, own, on our own terms and be expressive, it's also core to the American ethos that we profess. Secondly, our concept of art and cultural engagement has to be expansive. Of course, it includes the professional production of work and the consumption of that work, which can be transcendent, it also includes various forms of active engagement, making, doing, teaching, learning, as part of everyday life. Third, art process can be as important as, or in some cases even more important than art product. 
And sometimes that's hard for people to, to swallow. But I believe that the act of being in creative process often has value in and of itself. And sometimes that participation in process is the point, the thing that matters most. Doesn't take away from the importance of art products, but what I'm saying is the consideration of process is also so valuable. Fourth, artists, culture bearers, designers have many kinds of critically important relationships to publics. And by extension, they have many possible ways of developing their careers beyond the too few and narrow paths that we've paid so far. So thinking about the role of artists, designers, culture bearers outside of their lane, that's exactly what I want to push. And last, the arts are in intrinsically valuable, full stop. At the same time, they're critical elements of other community dynamics, needs, and aspirations, including those deeply connected to building healthy communities. At their most impactful, the arts are often part of what I think of as our civic infrastructure. So those relationships and mechanisms that we rely on to care for each other. These guiding premises, together with what I'm hearing and experiencing as I travel around the country, inform my vision and priorities as chair of the NEA. So consistent with these insights, I've been advancing the importance of all people having the ability to live artful lives. And artful lives is an inclusive concept that encompasses the everyday, sometimes non-professional, but deeply meaningful practices and expressions inherent in our daily lives. Again, that active engagement that allows us to lean into all humans' capacity to create, imagine, and tell our stories. It also includes the making, presentation, and dissemination of professional art from all disciplines and traditions, work that can be sublime and transcendent. In addition to the concept of artful lives, I've been talking about how unleashing the full power of art requires it to not exist in isolation or a bubble. The idea of arts in all requires animating work at the intersections of arts in many other fields, education, community development, climate, health, health and well-being, among others. This way of thinking about art requires a multi-pronged approach to assess and communicate value. And for so many years, our default way of assessing and communicating value has been focused on economic impacts. And while this continues to be an important way of valuing and understanding value, without question, it can't be the only way we understand value. We have to recognize contributions that have to do with health, wellness, the quality of our social fabric, and more, in addition to economic impacts. These ideas have an effect on how the NEA is showing up and how it will continue to show up. We continue to be a funder and a grant-making organization, which is what we're known for mostly. But we're also leaning into our role as a national resource one that creates and bolsters healthy arts ecosystems and contributes to building communities where all people can thrive, where people can lead artful lives, and the important work happening at the intersection of arts and other fields of policy and practice is strengthened. In terms of the specifics of serving as a national resource and what that means for the field, the intent is for the NEA to access and deploy all of the assets it has as its, at its disposal as a federal agency. And this includes grant money and financial resources, but it also includes leveraging our relationships to other federal agencies. The bullhorn and ex of the executive branch and using that um, platform to educate about the arts. The imprimatur of the federal government the infrastructure of state arts organizations, regional arts organizations, and local arts agencies, as well as other networks. The perspective and analysis that we can render from a national perch, our ability to commission and conduct research about the roles of the arts in our society, including focusing on health and well-being, 
and our ability to connect and convene communities of learning and practice, our ability to catalyze ideas and to amplify ideas and ways of working. There are many current efforts underway that illustrate how we're showing up as a partner and a national resource. So for example, in 2022, just last year, after an extensive review of NEA work and an expansive process of collecting feedback from internal and external parties, the Arts Endowment unveiled a new strategic plan that asserts our commitment to expand our work at the intersection of arts, health, and well-being. This leads us to bolster existing work in the realm, in this realm, including our work with the Department of Defense and Veterans Affairs on creative forces, helping to address post-traumatic stress disorder among military personnel, as well as our work with university partners to better understand the roles of the arts in a wide range of healing goals. It also calls us to strengthen our relationships with others, such as the Department of Health and Human Services, as well as the Surgeon General, who are, they're both increasingly focusing on well-being and mental health, and easily see the bridges between the arts and that, that uh, priority. Another example of leaning into this identity as uh, a national resource is that last year we entered into a partnership with the General Services Administration. And the General Services Administration is sort of like the landlord for federal government. It's an, it's an, interesting, uh, an interesting agency. But we're collaborating with them on their arts and architecture program, which requires that half a percent of new construction resources be allocated for arts commissions within federal properties. So between now and 2026, $3.4 billion are going into construction under GSA. This creates about $17 million available for new art commissions, new opportunities for artists. The NEA has been working with the GSA to help bolster awareness among artists on how to compete for these public commissions, especially making sure that underrepresented communities know about these exciting opportunities. In another partnership with uh, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, and the CDC Foundation, we launched an initiative that engages artists and arts organizations to promote COVID vaccine readiness in their communities. And as a result, the, with funding from the CDC Foundation, we were able to award grants to 30 organizations nationwide to support these efforts. These are just a few examples of existing work. We've had really fruitful conversations with leaders in the Department of Transportation, as well as Housing and Urban Development, as well as the White House-based office that's coordinating the implementation of federal investments in our physical infrastructure around the country. In all instances, there's appetite to figure out how to integrate arts and culture into current work, recognizing that these can be win-win collaborations. It creates opportunities for artists and arts organizations, and it helps these other realms of work do their best. In leaning into our role as a national resource, I always say that we're not starting from scratch, and our work in the realm of arts education is a great example of this. Based on our belief in equitable access to arts education for every student, and our vision of a nation where every student is engaged and empowered through excellent arts education. I believe that our relationships with the Department of Education and work at state and local levels will be bolstered. Um, it'll only become stronger in the next few years. I believe arts education is one of the most foundational avenues to people having artful lives. We know arts education can play a critically important role in meeting the social and emotional learning needs of students at home and in the classroom. We also know about the impacts that arts education can have on long-term outcomes, including educational attainment and socioeconomic prospects, and among other outcomes. 
Through the NEA's arts, part, arts education program, we're committed to breaking down barriers so that students have equitable access to arts education and will continue to help reinforce the value of arts education by providing direct learning grants which increase student knowledge and skills in the arts, helping, to, helping them to reach their full potential, um, professional development grants which build the capacity of urban and rural classroom teachers and teaching artists to effectively teach and measure student learning in the arts, and our collective impact grants, which transform schools and communities by providing access and engagement in the arts for all students through collective systemic approaches. About 75% of our arts education grants directly engage underrepresented populations, and we're working to bridge the opportunity gap for youth with the least access to arts education and position arts education as a vehicle for transforming individual students, the communities, and the schools themselves. In 2022, President Biden issued an executive order on advancing equity and support for underserved communities. And at this time, the NEA, in support of that, introduced its equity action plan for fiscal year 2022 to 2026. Uh, the plan builds on our support of community engagement, inclusion, and equitable access for all Americans. And the NEA has ongoing outreach programs to advance engagement. Uh, with a wide range of players and specifically um, helping historically black colleges and universities, Hispanic serving institutions and tribal college, tribal colleges as a way to encourage young leaders to understand the centrality of arts in our society and the centrality of again what I think of as our arts infused civic infrastructure. For more than 28 years the NEA has partnered with the Department of Education on the Arts Education Partnership. And this is the nation's hub for research, policy, and practice for arts and education leaders. We're so proud uh, to help build that leadership capacity to support students, educations, sorry, educators, and learning environments. And I see this uh, continuing to be strengthened in, in my tenure. We work very closely with the Department of Education and will continue to do so. And we're fortunate that Secretary Cardona is a big proponent of arts education. And he was recently quoted as saying, an arts education is essential to the whole of education. Art heals, art inspires, art engages. It shapes our thinking and it moves us to action. Raising the bar in education must include the arts. So we're looking forward to continuing our, sh our partnership with Secretary Cardona and uh, acting on his words and our deep commitment. There are some other things that you may know already about the NEA and some of the work that we do uh, as part of arts education and beyond. One is the Poetry Out Loud program, which, how many of you are familiar with Poetry Out Loud? Yeah. So for, for some of you that may not know, Poetry Out Loud is a recitation competition for high school students. It's managed in partnership with the Poetry Foundation and the state arts agencies across the country. And the program helps students to experience the power of poetry in helping us to better understand the world around us while also building students' self-confidence. And if you've ever seen the competitions, you get goosebumps. Uh, when you see the students recite and to stand there so confident. Um, anyway, the 2022 National Poetry Out Loud champion is Mia Ron, and she's a student at Archer School for Girls in Southern California in Los Angeles. The NEA also fosters student creativity through the power of song and storytelling in the musical theater songwriting challenge. How, much, how many of you are familiar with that? maybe a little less known. It's a program uh, for high school students that's nurturing the next generation of songwriters. Both of these programs help to recognize and hone their voices through artistic expression, propelling them in ways that benefit them and all of us. So you, they may not be professional songwriters in the end, or they may not be poets as their primary profession going forward, but they carry that with them in whatever pathways they choose, and we benefit as a result. I d deeply believe that. 
Our attention to the next generation of art leaders and stakeholders in the arts is so important. We know that the work requires deep and long commitment and that the baton has to be passed from one generation to the next to sustain and expand gains in this realm. We know this isn't just add water and stir work. This is long work. In thinking about next generations of leaders, um, I want to give a special acknowledgement to a small group of young women who came to this event from St. Mary's Academy, a high school in Inglewood. Uh, St. Mary's is my high school alma mater. And I was so surprised and touched and proud when I learned that these students were coming to this lecture and that the school now has a dedicated track focused on careers in the arts. So ladies from St. Mary's, if you could just wave so people see you. It's a, a beautiful example of uh, leaders that will continue this work and to hopefully take it to places we can't even imagine right now. In closing, I, I want to reiterate that this is a time to build anew, think anew, and imagine the role of the arts in forming healthy places, opportunity-rich communities around the country. Your leaders, your trailblazers, your thought partners that have the greatest proximity to the communities we want to see flourish, and you help set the course for transforming the future of our nation. And despite the known challenges, I am so excited about the opportunities before us and what we might do together. This is the time to dream big and not stay in our lanes. So. So I thank you again for all you do and for listening this morning. I'm looking forward to the conversation. So thank you so much, Chair Jackson. And um, I have a, a great list of questions, but I've added a few because of your inspiring words. And uh, I, I do want to start with maybe it's a very obvious one that uh, we often get asked when we take on uh, a new challenge, a new responsibility. What do you hope to have accomplished? How will the world have changed after your tenure at the NEA? Well, you know, can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. These, um, these positions we don't have forever, right? So taking uh, advantage of the current opportunities, we know there are lots of challenges. We're coming out of COVID, hopefully. Um, there, there are shifts in the ecosystem of the arts in the same way that there are shifts in our natural ecosystems and we have to adapt. Uh, my hope is that over the next couple of years um, that the National Endowment for the Arts actually plays a role as a partner in figuring out what is the next version of the sector. So this is, this is a moment in history where People will look back and say before COVID, after COVID. Um, and COVID certainly isn't the only thing in the water that we have to be uh, concerned with. There's so many other things that have longer roots. But I think um, the arts endowment having played a role in helping to devise what the next version looks like, hopefully a version that um, is more expansive, that is true to its um, desire to have access for everyone. Uh, so there, there are goals around accessibility, there are goals around uh, understanding the role of the arts in a way that is not isolated, recognizing that at its most powerful, the arts are woven into so many dimensions of our life and society. So I hope to have offered something that moves, moves us in that direction. Um, the same thing is true as it pertains to 
how we think of artists and the roles that artists play in communities. Um, in my remarks, I said that there, there are a few well-paved roads, but there are so many ways that, that artists can contribute um, that we haven't yet figured out how to support. And I, mean, I was asked a question as actually at an arts education partnership meeting uh, several months ago. There was a student, really bright student, and he asked a similar question. Uh, but if he gave me a longer time frame. He was like, you know, 20 years from now or whatever. Uh, and, you know, my response to him was, I hope that there are so many more opportunities for artists that we can't even imagine right now. So this idea of not staying in your lane, if they are able to deliver their talents and gifts in ways that um, don't preclude their other interests, that help us do our best work in so many dimensions. That was really long, I'm sorry. No, no, but I, I think that uh, one of the things that, that people often think of when they think of the role of government, mm -hmm. and particularly the federal government because of how huge it is, what a huge country we have, uh, is uh, can there be that much accomplished in a short period of time in a role like like yours, and uh, in assessing your priorities, um, you know, you're, you're dealing with just uh, e enormous obstacles, uh, and I, I wonder how, when you first were invited to take on this role, mm -hmm. what went through your mind? <laughs> oh God, so much went through my mind. Um, <laughs> I think you're right. There are many obstacles, but there are also many opportunities. And that's what keeps me going, right, is, is the, the opportunities. And I think um, there's, there is, uh, you have to believe when you are in these positions for limited times that there are things that you can do that are durable within that government system. There are things that might be seeded, but actually grow somewhere else. And then there are things that are available to you for a season. And, and you have to be judicious enough to assess and reassess and understand what is it that you're building and what category does it fall in and what, and what does it require, right? So there are some things that I believe are available to us now that I am hoping we can unlock. And so, for example, there is an unprecedented investment in our physical infrastructure, much needed. Um, as I was talking with Secretary Buttigieg uh, some months ago, we were talking about what the NEA and the Department of Transportation might do together. And there was no lack of understanding that um, when you're talking about building communities back, it isn't just the physical. There is a social component. There is um, great opportunity for artists to contribute in both the physical through public art and design, but also in thinking about, uh, in some cases, how we reconnect communities that have been physically divided for years as a result of urban renewal and planning decisions that were not so great from decades ago. There are some programs now that are intended to re-knit physically those communities. Um, it's not just physical, it's also social. And the ability to have the power of the arts inform both processes, I think, are, is, is just a missed opportunity if we don't figure out how to do that. <laughs> The recognition that uh, of that opportunity has certainly been uh, taken on and uh, approached and implemented in communities around our nation and uh, uh, often in the name of economic development and that was something that you referenced in your talk uh, and uh, in some instances it has not been a positive contributor 
to the social fabric in those communities. And I, I wondered if you might talk a little bit about that because I think that that's something that we here in some parts of Orange mm -hmm. County in particular have experienced some displacement as a result of you know, visionary uh, uh, art artists coming in. I, I look back to the book that Richard Florida wrote mm -hmm. 20 years ago, The Rise of the Creative Class, and how, you know, uh, uh, what were then called blighted areas mm -hmm. of inner city cores were being, uh, uh, were attracting young artists because of low rents and the ability to have studios there and live there. Uh, but that uh, there was not a lot of thought given to the residents or the uh, indigenous mm -hmm. businesses there that were ultimately displaced as rents rose and as uh, as those areas became popular tourist destinations mm -hmm. and uh, drove uh, an economic engine that had these uh, unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. So as an urban planner in particular, yeah. I'm sure you've given a lot of thought to this. Yeah, I have, and I think the framing of the issue has to be questioned, right? So it's, it's not that the artist who will attract so much is at the center of that problem. It is the lack of protections for people who are socioeconomically vulnerable that is the challenge, right? So there, there's, a, there's a tendency to, to mm, I think, frame problematically and sometimes oversimplify what the issue is. Um, I think that uh, there are ways to continue to encourage um, artists, arts organizations, cultural life in a very robust way and still have that tied to protections for socioeconomically vulnerable populations and devise strategies where those populations can actually benefit. I think when that kind of development happens and it's not tied to a consciousness around what happens to communities that have been there um, and have often been there in very marginal terms, that's the problem, right? So it's, it's a bit of a shifting of what is, what is the issue. Um, but it's, it's something that, uh, again, for me, underscores the necessity to build those bridges between the cultural sector and other areas of policy and practice that inevitably, inevitably come together um, in our daily lived experience, as they do in these neighborhoods. Uh, but as someone who's, who comes out of a comprehensive community development frame, that's where I would, I, would, I would tinker with how we're framing the issue and make sure that those investments, when they are art-based, are connected to other strategies that um, ensure a win-win situation. So I want to turn uh, the discussion over uh, to the subject of arts education uh, in recognition of our partners at OC Department of Ed in, in particular and the great work they're doing and all the other arts, uh, the arts organizations in this uh, room who have arts education programs that go into the schools or that are after school programs. Um, so here are some questions that our arts educators have uh, shared with me. Um, how do we validate, and I'm going to ask you all three because you may want to kind okay. of meander through all this. How do we validate and affirm students through arts education? How do we promote a sense of inclusion and belonging in school mm -hmm. through arts education? And how do we ensure that students see themselves in the materials that are presented and designed? Mm. Those are all great questions. Uh, they all require intention intention and resources. Um, I think that through arts education, there is a terrific opportunity for uh, representation, for the development of self-expression, um, for the lifting up of difference and commonality. 
for the analysis of our world and context through an arts prism. Um, I'm often baffled when there isn't recognition that um, integration of arts and culture into our K through 12 or and beyond um, wouldn't matter, right? So it, it's, it's uh, in some ways as if we're not acknowledging the full humanity of our students when it doesn't exist. Right, so there's there's something, and I'm gonna go off a little bit, but there there's there's something that we know um, that has to do with only educating to the intellectual that is partial and insufficient. Um, I think there have been studies that have been done that when people are actually um, available to shifts in paradigm, to shifts in way of thinking, it is because they've been engaged head, heart, hand. Right? They've been engaged intellectually, emotionally, and physically, which is what we do through the arts. Um, so why would we not want to fully engage our students? Um, why would we want to limit development, li limit progress? Um, I'm not sure I, which of those questions I answered, but there, there's, some, there's something in respecting the fullness of our humanity in a K through 12 setting that requires arts education and an arts education that also recognizes the creator in all of us. Well, you know, you mentioned in your talk early on, and I, I think I'd, I, it relates to this, and I think I'd like to also hear you expand on it a little bit when you talked about um, my scrawl here. Um, you know, making sense of the world, uh, which, you know, I think uh, was a little more understandable than the next thing you said, which was... Uh, being in sync with the American ethos. And I'd love to hear you expand a little bit about that because, you know, the unusual nature of our nation and uh, the role of the arts and kind of the historic evolution of the arts in this country compared to, you know, uh, indigenous cultures where the arts are part of the very fabric of your daily life, your daily existence, or in Europe where, you know, the model that, you know, so much of our institution building uh, in arts and culture has been, you know, modeled on. Uh, and, um, and then also, and I don't want to put you unnecessarily on the spot, but in the present world that we're living in where there's so much divisiveness uh, going on and um, uh, healthy and sometimes unhealthy debate about what the American ethos really is. If, if we think about the American ethos as, as opportunity, as um, the ability to reach our full potential, um, the arts has to be a part of that. That that's um, it's a huge missing element if it is intended to. So I think of uh, you know why the United States continues to be a beacon for its promise. Um, I think that promise can't be reached without full recognition of our humanity. Full recognition of our humanity requires the arts. There's no getting around it. Um, so that's what I mean when I, when I tie it to this idea of American ethos. Um, yeah, I, I have, my career has been about trying to find that arts and culture puzzle piece that is often missing in how we approach 
uh, creating places where all people can thrive. Right? So I think I connect those thoughts to that idea of American ethos. Thank you. So speaking for a moment about uh, the moment that we're in in terms of uh, having to come up with new ways as a result of uh, not just COVID, as you indicated, but uh, things that were already evolving, trends that were beginning that, uh, and you know, we have a lot of arts leaders here in this mm -hmm. uh, room who run different kinds of arts organizations, small, medium, and large, and uh, have suffered uh, uh, considerable losses of audience and uh, financing during the pandemic. Uh, many of them already recognized that there were changes in uh, people's behavior and how they interacted with the arts experiences uh, prior to that, but that the pandemic really kind of accelerated this mm -hmm. uh, and accelerated uh, the recognition of uh, uh, the need to, within their own organizations and, and staffs and boards and, and programming, uh, the need to accelerate uh, their equity and inclusion. Uh, and the rapidity of this ha and the shock of it has been so hard for uh, so many people to be able to cope with and respond to. And, and uh, I think if, if you have any thoughts that you might like to share, the, uh, any ideas, any things, maybe some examples of, that you've seen of uh, organizations who've made significant shifts in response to what's gone on in the past few years, whether it's COVID or whether it's these other trends, uh, as uh, models that we could look to, as inspiration that we could take. Yeah, there, there's there's two things that I that I want to say in response to to the question and the observations that you just shared, and I think um, we are in an extraordinary time where, for the last three years, we had to question our orthodoxies, and um, perhaps stretched in ways that we didn't think were possible or uh, appropriate, even, and. I think that coming out of this, there's a piece of work that has to do with harvesting what we learned. And I think we have to be intentional about that. We have to be intentional about um, figuring out what was questioned, what was even debunked, um, and what is essential. What do you have to hold on to? Right, having that discernment and uh, the ability to do that as a community is something that I think we have to be intentional about. And I know that those forums don't always exist. I hope that one of the things that uh, the Arts Endowment can do together with state arts agencies and other partners is develop those forums where that harvesting of, of what it we learn can actually happen. Um, I've been in, over the last few years, in um, some conversations that were deeply impactful. I remember being um, in a conversation with uh, the leader of a, of a symphony, with the leader of a theater organization, and as we all know, the um, performing arts were especially hard hit. And there was, there was appropriately a lot of um, angst around not being able to bring audiences back. Um, and there was, there was an interesting analysis of the things that militated against that happening, right? So they were saying, you know, there's been a downturn in the economy. People don't want to come downtown anymore. Our audiences are elderly, and they're still fearful for public health reasons. Um, and, and they could go on, right? There was... There, uh, issues related to safety and uh, coming into the downtown area that wasn't as safe they felt anymore as it was a few years ago. 
And there was a lot of uh, analysis around those forces. What I didn't hear was the part that came next, hopefully, which is, so now I'm thinking this way. And there's something about being able to bridge from that state of angst to a state of imagination that, that that's what's available to us. That's where we have to go. And it can be really hard when you have to make payments or you have to make payroll or you have to pay the rent or you have to pay you know the whatever the fees are that are um, part of your particular set of arrangements. So it's, it's a scary time for a lot of people. Um, figuring out how to even in that context of fear and angst go into a place of imagination and think differently about what is possible. It's a t it feels like a tall order, but it's what we have to do. Right? It's hard when the thing that you long for, the thing that you know well, might not be available right now or might not be available for a while, you know, or ever, who knows, right? But how is it that we take what we learned in the last three years, how do we understand what are the bridges between virtual participation and live participation? You know, is there some spectrum? Is there a journey that people take from participating in a virtual way to a live way? Um, those are the kinds of questions that need to be explored. You know, what are the things that you can satisfy with a different means? What are the things that are absolutely essential and you can't? And I think, you know, it's not just in the presentation realm that there have been lessons learned, but even in education. And I'm, and I'm looking at my, my good friend, Dr. Lopez, who has had to step up and figure out how do we deliver um, and what are the modalities that are available to us now? How are we judicious about what we can do and can't do going forward? But there, there is something um, that is, it's not gonna feel satisfying because it's not a panacea, it's not an answer, but there is a process that we have to engage in as a community that has to do with what have we learned over the last few years? What do we know now that we didn't know then? And what does it mean as we imagine the next version of the sector? Because whether we're going willingly or kicking and screaming, we are charged with imagining the next version of the sector. Absolutely. Okay, I have a fun nuts and bolts question for you here. So uh, I am willing to bet that there are people in this room who think that you decide who gets the money. <laughs> so maybe, you know, without getting too much in the weeds, I think it would be great for those who really don't know how the endowment works, you know. Uh, how, 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 does, how does sausage get made at the endowment? <laughs> It depends on what kind of sausage you're talking about. But if you're, if you're talking about our typical grant programs, um, how many of you have been on NEA panels? Raise your hand. So some of you. I encourage all of you to, to uh, seek out the opportunity to, to be on an NEA panel. So our grant programs are, they go through a panel process, which means that they are reviewed by citizens. Uh, who make recommendations about who should get resources and who shouldn't in you know the competitive pool? Uh, it is um, I have been on you know prior to being in this position had been on several panels over the years. It is a, such an engaging and interesting process to be in conversation with your fellow citizens about 
where public money should go to support the arts. So there, there is a panel process. And, and I'm looking to my colleague, Sonia Tower, who's, who's over there. Raise your hand, Sonia, because Sonia can, can be a resource if people have more specific questions. But I think on our website, there is a, a pretty elaborate description of what the process is. But I'm, I'm really proud that we have uh, an adjudication process that includes the people, uh, that is primarily the people. There's more to the process, though. Oh, Do yeah. you really want to get into the nuts and bolts? I mean, it goes to it goes to uh, the panel process, then it goes to council, the National Council on the Arts, then it goes to the chair. But between all that, there's a lot of other work that happens in post panels where we're trying to understand what we're seeing in. Um, the applications that we receive, are we seeing trends in the field? Are we seeing things that we want to be able to address, that we want to lift up? Um, so there's a little more to it. Um, so I, I'm, I'm so glad you addressed in, in your talk as well the, uh, the idea that process is as important as mm -hmm. product because uh, uh, anybody who is uh, a practicing artist totally understands that. But uh, I think you know, we, we live in uh, a very consumerist uh, society where you know, it is all about you know, the end result, the product. Is it good? Is it something you want to buy? Is it something you want to watch? And um, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more of your thoughts on the process of being an artist and of, uh, to the extent perhaps that the endowment is supporting the process versus the product as well. So there, um, there's definitely a lot to be said about the process for artists. I think though, I want to extend that and focus on the importance of the creative process just for everybody, right? So in addition to, of course, wanting to create the environment where artists can thrive, do their work, have fulfilling, satisfying creative processes as a, a part of what they do, I think we also need to look to other people who don't see themselves as artists and may not don that identity, that's not the profession they've chosen. Um, this whole idea of artful lives, I think, leans into the importance of people having a healthy creative practice just as part of being a whole human. So I, I want to lift that part of process up as well. One of the things that we've done recently at the Arts Endowment is uh, add creative process to our definition of, um, to our guidelines, so that there is more of a focus on creative process. And I, you know, I started using that idea to animate a lot of my work uh, through my career, because I understood that from uh, the perspective of someone who's looking to see benefits accrue, to communities, um, often the engagement in a creative process is what uh, allows for the development of agency, of social cohesion, of bridging across difference. There's, there are many um, outcomes or impacts that have to do not necessarily with the thing that was built at the end, but the process of being in creative practice, whether it was individually or collectively. So I, early on, it, it was very clear to me that focusing on that process was really important if we were truly going to 
integrate arts, culture, and design into how we think of healthy places. Uh, and that's not to say that there shouldn't be focus on excellent product, right? That's, that, that those things are not um, at odds. Uh, but I think that understanding that there is value in the creative process itself is something that we tend to um, perhaps not always intentionally diminish because we're so focused on the product. And, and here again, there are different, if we talk about artists, there are different pathways that artists take. There are some artists that are not, um, they're not looking to make the thing to go in the exhibition. They're, they have a different goal. Um, and it was very interesting years ago, uh, many years ago, I was on an evaluation team for a new program that was focused on uh, what people think of as social practice arts. And there was um, debate because the institution that was putting forward the, the program had uh, some of the requirements were very much about exhibition. And some of the students at the time, artists, were in a healthy way calling that into question and saying, what I want to be evaluated on is the experience that I created for people to engage in, not the artifact of that experience. And that was difficult sometimes for people to to wrestle with, right? You know, it, it, well, well, it shouldn't it be about the thing at the end? Well, in this case, no, because that wasn't the intention of the artist. The artist was actually trying to create something that was transcendent in the process, not necessarily the thing at the end. So I think, you know, understanding that the broad range of ways in which artists pursue their craft and pursue their careers and how our validation mechanisms haven't caught up with that is really important because that's a body of work that has to be further developed. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, I think to conclude, I did want to share with you uh, that uh, your visit here is the first time since 1988 that a chair of the National Endowment for the Arts has visited Orange County. Oh. And uh, <laughs> we are so appreciative. Uh, this building wasn't here then, I can tell you. <laughs> and a lot of our infrastructure in Orange County, our arts infrastructure, so many of the organizations in this room were not here at that time. Uh, we've had this marvelous evolution really over the past uh, 30 to 40 years. And yes, there are some much older organizations uh, in the community as well, but uh, it's, uh, it's great to have you here. We hope that uh, you, this will not be your only or last visit to Orange County and that you will have an opportunity to experience and uh, visit more of our arts community uh, in the future. And thank you again for joining well, us thank today. you. It I'm just going to say it, it, it's an honor to be um, so close to home. As many of you know, I'm, I'm a Southern Californian, um, L.A., and it, it is an honor uh, to, to be here with you today to see your commitment uh, to the arts and to uh, everything that the arts contribute to. So I'm, I am happily... Uh, here and happily willing to come back whenever is helpful. Uh, just know that. <laughs>